so hi, uh, my name is Matthias and um, I'm going to talk about the quantum computers and their impact on our future today. Um, so you might have heard uh, about quantum computers these days and that they will change our, our world uh, drastically uh, in terms of computational speed uh, and so on. So let me start with uh, some history where this comes from. Um, so in 1982, uh, Richard Feynman, a theoretical physicist, imagined a computer which could have uh, the potential to improve computational speed tremendously uh, by using the laws of uh, quantum mechanics. So the conclusions uh, you will hear in this talk are definitely based on, on technical proofs, but unfortunately, uh, I won't have time uh, for technical details. So I will rather talk about uh, the impacts uh, it will have in the future. So uh, clearly for a quantum computer, there, needs, uh, there, there has to be computer science and math involved. This is important to mention because it plays a, a huge role in the performance of a quantum computer. And um, actually, the first wave of popularity uh, the quantum computer gained was in 1994, uh, where a mathematician named Peter Shor uh, uh, invented an algorithm especially designed uh, for quantum computers uh, to factor very, very large numbers into their uh, prime uh, factors much faster than a classical algorithm could. So you might ask uh, why, this is, why this was such an important step for quantum computers. Um, well, I will discuss that in a bit, uh, but first uh, let's take a look at the level of research we are at. So now I talked like quantum computers were only a fantasy yet, but they are not. In fact, they exist already. As you can see uh, here, in this slide, uh, uh, you can see that they exist, uh, quantum computers. Well, the left one is from Google and the right one is uh, from IBM. Well, there are also other, a few other companies uh, who even uh, developed uh, some commercialized systems. Uh, the most famous one is on the, on the left from uh, D-Wave Systems, a Canadian company who sold their quantum computer already to investors like Google, NASA, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, and Lockheed Martin uh, already in 2017. Uh, the one on the right is even a newer system um, from IBM, but I don't, uh, don't found much information about that. But uh, I have to say these systems are not very sophisticated yet, uh, and they had not the, the super computational speed that uh, we expected by now but we will see uh, what the future brings. So in the next few slides, I will talk about uh, the main fields where quantum computing could have a large impact on in the, in the future if they uh, become really powerful. And the first field and more probably the most feared one uh, because it, it directly impacts uh, our security is a uh, crypto cryptography. So, um, I previously told that the reason for the quantum computer to have gained such popularity was because of a man named uh, Peter Shore, who invented this special algorithm I mentioned. Well, you might have heard about uh, RSA. Uh, this is more probably the most used encryption systems system in our digital world. As you might have uh, guessed, Shore's algorithm uh, counters that encryption systems system and unlike in a classical way it could encode this code in a matter of minutes rather than years uh, but obviously you need a, a fairly powerful quantum computer for that and as i said they are not very sophisticated uh, the quantum computers that exist by now but definitely you begin to see why people start to think or even worry about quantum computers and also, you can imagine that this is clearly a thing that is very interesting to governments, for example. And sure, this is. As you might have expected, well, the NSA, hello NSA, 
um, is already investing in large scales into quantum computers, according uh, to the Washington Post. Well, and this article, you see it on the top left, is from 2014. And well, what do we have to think now about our security? I mean, this is quite a few years ago. And also China is not uh, stepping behind. Um, they are. They also are said to invest in the in the largest quantum laboratory in the world. So, what happens if quantum computers really start to take over the world of cryptography? And do we have to consider taking actions now rather than only after it is here? So, for example, uh, the secret data of governments is actually kept secret for a fairly long period of time, mostly between 20 and 30 years. Well, imagine if somebody is collecting uh, this encrypted data already uh, and store it, uh, but they cannot encrypt it for now. So if in five to 10 years, we would have quantum computers that are able uh, to encode this information, you could, you could imagine that, that this would lead to global issues in politics and and relations between different countries. So we definitely have to consider taking some actions already now to avoid uh, worst scenarios. So concretely, this means that institutions which own large amount of secure data have to think about using uh, different encryption systems, system, which can't uh, be encrypted by a quantum computer. So indeed, there are proofs to different algorithms uh, which won't be computed faster by a, qu a quantum computer than a classical one. So they definitely have to think about, uh, di implement different algorithms. And also uh, these institutions have to think about storing their data on different types of uh, storage methods. Uh, well, actually, in practice, the most secure way uh, to store data safely will still be the physical way, meaning no cloud, no uh, other connections to other systems, completely uh, se separated from all other connections. And it will be definitely the safest way uh, for a few more decades. So with that being said, uh, the next field where quantum computing uh, will definitely have an impact um, is in optimization. Well, uh, this includes uh, artificial intelligence as well as machine learning uh, algorithms. So imagine, imagine the improvements we could make with the ability to, to compute things much faster in, in for example, uh, process design in industries or to optimize uh, even a trip to Mars in terms of resources, for example. So one can imagine uh, that also uh, financial institutions um, begin to, to make more accurate uh, market predictions or even optimize uh, our financial system, which would be, would be really great. So, um, also you can imagine uh, that, that a very fast computer also a classical one, uh, could improve the analysis of, of big data uh, significantly. Um, so at the beginning, I mentioned uh, Richard Feynman, uh, the first to be said to actually uh, have imagined a quantum computer. Uh, so the reason for him to imagine such a thing was the fact that if we had a quantum computer, we could simulate all kinds of things. Imagine simulating the weather and make uh, weather predictions uh, for a much longer period of time or, or simulating complex mechanical systems. We could also find new materials by simulating new molecules or, or find uh, the right medication for a disease much faster than today. To give a fairly relevant example here with coronavirus. Um, and ultimately, well, the fact of quantum compute computing in general, um, working with very fundamental physics, started to create um, a whole new research field. And I mean by that, that it is not only the computational power of a quantum computer 
that that improves our world but the fact that that we have to do a deep physical research for for a quantum computer um, could lead to new discoveries and give us a, a better understanding of of how our nature behaves so Let's quickly overview uh, uh, the, well, oh, sorry, I forgot this slide. Uh, well, this, this was about the simulations. So, well, let's quickly overview the, the stakeholders that I mentioned uh, so far. Um, for sure, it all begins at academic institutions where the most of today's research is done. Furthermore, uh, governments and financial institutions will definitely have a huge uh, interest in quantum computing in terms of cryptography and computational speed, uh, as we saw before. As well as uh, Google, IBM, Microsoft, uh, etc., uh, which I summed up as uh, digital giants here. And also quantum startups like D-Wave Systems, as we saw, might be very close to an actual uh, quantum computer. So it is not that far away. And I separated the industrial research from the academic because um, they often have uh, very different approaches to those technologies. Well, the industrial research, their goal is finally to make a product. And for that, they have to be uh, in terms, well, they have to be more specific in their research um, as academic re um, institutions. Well, okay. Now, we saw what impact quantum computing could have on, on very different uh, kind of fields. And we saw that there is indeed a, a huge potential for quantum computers. So if there is a quantum future, what do we have to consider in terms of implementation and, and value sensitive design? Well, we can't go into very specific details uh, of all by in all kinds of fields I talked about, um, but I can make some some general proposals to definitely uh, consider in a quantum uh, future. We want to make sure that uh, the quantum computers take the right path to all those uh, uh, brilliant implications we saw before rather than uh, being some tool of, well, of corrupt uh, governments or, or some massive digital data monsters. Um, yeah, w what we can say is that in the near future, quantum computing will, will definitely be very clunky and very, very expensive. So, uh, so they will definitely not be available for everybody. And, Honestly, most of our society won't notice uh, big changes in the next decade due to quantum computers. Well, I want to mention that you might have noticed during the talk now that I almost all companies I mentioned uh, which began to invest in, in the quantum future were North American, specifically from the United States. And well, this is, this is a matter of a fact. So uh, the, my, my intention here is, so we have to consider that quantum computers could be monopolized by large companies or governments. And, and clearly this would lead to an unequal distribution of power. And because quantum computers are so expensive, uh, this is very likely to happen at the beginning. And, and smaller companies and startups uh, will have a very hard time to compete against uh, those giants I mentioned before. So, in fact, uh, the European Commission already thought about that and created a research initiative called uh, the European Quantum Flagship. So they bring together scientists and engineers from Europe and try to stay in the race uh, between the giants and try to compete with them. So, well... Even if at the beginning of the quantum future, um, they must be some monopoles formed to even start uh, doing some research about this topic. Um, this could change with time. If, if those uh, 
who already are researching uh, develop more sophisticated uh, technologies and structures but we definitely have to make sure that there is a solid ground for that to happen so um, I thought about three important steps that we should definitely take to achieve a good implementation of uh, the quantum computers. So first, we have to make sure that the knowledge about quantum future is widely accessible and that people start talking about it. Specifically, that researchers take uh, the responsibility to insist in publishing uh, their, their research about this topic. Well, it might be uh, for the industry, it might be uh, with the delay for commercial reasons, but definitely they have to make uh, this information available to, to all of us. So, and secondly, I mentioned that quantum computers uh, would be very expensive and that they won't be available for all of us. So instead of hoping to compress this immense computational power to a form of, of a computer, a lab or a laptop, which is quite unrealistic, we should definitely consider to build a, a cloud computing network or something uh, similar, which can be used by all of us. Even if at the beginning this implies a, a small fee from from the providers but uh, this is definitely a good idea and this would improve algorithms and software uh, developers uh, to develop uh, new kinds of algorithms and software for quantum computers much more efficient and empower small companies to start to make uh, their own research as well as give us uh, the ability to form even uh, uh, decentralized computational systems uh, like cryptocurrencies, smart contracts, uh, or other uh, decentralized systems, and that the fee would, uh, of using those, those computers would fall away. So, um, in fact, there are already some basic platforms uh, which let you try to implement uh, quantum algorithms and test them, for example, you can look at the site uh, of IBM or D-Wave Systems, they have such platforms. So, and the third thing I want to mention is that we have to make sure that the existing um, data and computing market is well regulated uh, fairly by the government and, and that this whole uh, data market is working like, well, like a closed loop. Uh, and, and with closed loop, I, I'm referring here uh, to a talk uh, last week. Um, I think it was the first one or so where we talked about uh, the data market as a whole. So, well, finally, uh, with that being said, um, let's complete uh, the stakeholders uh, with us. Well, uh, because for sure at the end, all technologies will have an impact on, on the global society, uh, which means uh, us. Well, um, clearly all of them, all of the stakeholders have, have some kind of responsibility and um, to, to make sure that quantum computers will improve our world uh, in a good way. And really, it all starts uh, with talking about it and spread this information around the globe uh, so that we can work together as a society and make sure that uh, this quantum future will be an experience uh, which we won't regret at all. So, uh, well, with that being said, um, this is a good transition uh, to open the discussion here. And yeah, um, thank you for listening.